Imagine yourself on a distant planet, light years from the concerns of human civilization. Imagine you're standing before Mark Rothko's 1950 painting, White Center. Imagine that the painting before you is not a great work of art, created by one of America's most revered artists, but is instead an inscrutable alien monolith, a mystifying object of unknown origin and purpose. And then imagine that this strange object by some unaccountable power draws you near. This is how you should look at a Rothko. Why? Because Mark Rothko didn't think any explanation of his artwork was necessary in order to get it. He believed that the purest form of art shouldn't place any obstacles between the artwork and the viewer, and shouldn't require any special knowledge. And yet he believed without any knowledge or outside help, those who viewed his paintings could have intense emotional reactions. But of course, not everyone's reaction is the same. Some stare into Rothko's floating rectangles and are deeply moved, while others are confounded by Rothko's simple colors and shapes. Some are moved to tears, and some feel nothing at all. To Rothko? Why the hell didn't Dale say that? So it's smudgy squares, huh? That's interesting. Maybe he has a brochure in here or something that explains it. I don't think it's supposed to be explained. I'm an artist, okay? It must mean something. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe you're just supposed to experience it. Because when you look at it, you do feel something, right? It's like looking into something very deep. You could fall in. That's true. Did someone tell you that? <laughs> How could someone tell you that? This is pointless. Let's go. I'm ready. Although the painting featured in the episode of Bad Men is not a real Rothko, the way the cast members experience the painting is true to life. Rothko paintings don't conform to what people traditionally expect art to be. We may wonder how something so simple can be great art. We may wonder how something so simple can be profound. But it's actually the simplicity of Rothko's paintings that make them so compelling. It's the ambiguity that draws us in. But of course, it's also the ambiguity that confounds. We naturally want to know the meaning of things. We want to know the purpose of things. We want concrete answers. But Rothko paintings are inherently ambiguous. They don't really have meaning or subject matter in any traditional sense. Rothko's art is free from people and objects, symbols, icons, idols, really anything that has a specific meaning. Unlike his contemporaries like Willem de Kooning and Jackson Pollock, Rothko's paintings are not gestural, and were not meant to be self-expressive. Rothko explicitly stated that he does not express himself in his paintings and does not wish his artwork to represent his ego or individual experience. While Pollock's paintings have become synonymous with individual agency, Rothko's paintings feel more elusive. They're like sunsets or the night sky. They feel like phenomena, free from the world of humans. Nothing in nature tells us how we should feel about a sunset, the sunset either elicits an emotional response or it doesn't. The beauty we find in a sunset is something we find in ourselves. The experience is subjective and individual. In a similar way, Rothko felt he was making a kind of pure art where the viewer experiences the painting directly and instinctively as a child might. With deceptively simple colors and shapes, Rothko felt he could convey ecstasy, tragedy, and doom. Rothko was serious about his art, as serious as artists come. He believed in the power of art and in the power of his own art. Now Rothko felt that identifiable subjects and objects in paintings acted as obstacles between the viewer and the artwork, and he was against critical dissection of art in general. Rothko emphasized that one does not paint for design students or historians, but for human beings. Rothko was interested in something much deeper, more primal than melting clocks, dancing figures, or portraits of women. He wanted to create a pure, transcendent experience for the viewer. But this is no easy task. How does an artist provide a transcendent experience simply by putting paint on a canvas? Well, Rothko was initially interested in depicting strange and mysterious forms. His early abstractions transitioned into what came to be called multiforms. These were then further reduced to the flat, luminous color fields that became Rothko's signature. In Jed Pearl's New Art City, Pearl describes Rothko as a romantic artist of sorts, 
who wanted to paint exotic, emotion-filled subject matter and travel to faraway places. So thinking about Rothko's work in relation to 19th century painters can help to illuminate Rothko's artistic driving force. Where romantic painters of the past could transport viewers to locations that were exotic to, say, 19th century Europeans, Rothko's floating forms could transport the viewer to spiritual places. But then the point of many 19th century paintings was in fact spirituality. One of the most famous romantic paintings of the 19th century, Caspar David Friedrich's Wanderer Above the Sea Fog, captures the contemplation of sublime nature, and in doing so, engenders self-reflection. Friedrich takes the viewer to a spiritual precipice, and asks them to peer beyond the misty mountains. Friedrich wanted to take the viewer on a spiritual ride. Interestingly, Friedrich's earlier Monk by the Sea shows a much reduced composition, yet is possibly more effective in invoking the spiritual and the sublime. So what separates Rothko from Friedrich and most painters that came before him? Well, Rothko's paintings are not representations of something else. They don't use metaphors and symbols to point to some idea or feeling. They are the thing itself. René Magritte wrote, Ceci n'est pas un pipe. This is not a pipe. Meaning that he had merely made a painting of a pipe. A Rothko painting is the pipe, the object itself. So Rothko paintings then, they don't depict things like most other paintings do. But they do have an originating idea. Rothko wanted an emotional transaction between the viewer and the painting to take place. And this transaction was quasi-religious. Rothko biographer James Breslin wrote, Rothko's signature paintings, in fact, create an empathetic space in which to confront emptiness and loss. They create environments for mourning. Rothko called his paintings presences, as though they transformed a loss into fullness or death into life. It's probably no coincidence that Rothko distilled the process for making his floating rectangles soon after his mother's death and continued making them for the rest of his life. Now, we could interpret Rothko's paintings as being about his mother, but Breslin thinks this is not quite right. Rothko's paintings may have been prompted by his mother's death, but they are not about his mother, and not even necessarily about loss. They transcend these emotions. And though the paintings seem to allow Rothko to transform loss into beauty, they remain primal, pre-language, pre-desire. Rothko believed that people shouldn't look to critics or art historians or society at large to form opinions about art but rather rely on themselves to discover insight. Rothko thought that academic dissection of art was an old paradigm. But this doesn't mean that Rothko wasn't academic in his approach to making art. Rothko was influenced by Nietzsche, Greek mythology, the architecture of Michelangelo, the drama of Rembrandt, the surrealism of Max Ernst. He took something essential from these influences and made art no one had ever seen before. And his paintings are actually quite technically sophisticated. Rothko mixed his own paints and prepared canvases with old master techniques. He created luminosity and complexity by applying incredibly thin layers of paint. But Rothko's chief imperative was always to give the viewer an emotional experience. And for Rothko, making the size of the paintings in human scale about the height of a human was an important part of achieving this experience. Rothko wanted the viewer to stand up close to the paintings, to be surrounded and engulfed by the image, to meditate on the image with sensitivity and mindfulness. Nobel Prize winning neuroscientist and Rothko lover Eric Kandel argues that abstract art requires the brain to use creativity and imagination to a much larger degree than realistic art. The ambiguity of abstract art requires the brain to go beyond the machine-like processing of visual information and use so-called top-down processing where the viewer recruits personal experiences to make sense of the image. Rothko famously wrote, The people who weep before my pictures are having the same religious experience I had when I painted them. It seems Rothko figured out a way to activate the brain in a unique and often profound way. He wanted his paintings to be conduits for ecstasy, tragedy, and doom. Rothko thought art was a sacred place to communicate big ideas, notoriously refusing to sell paintings to just anyone including JFK's sister, Jean Kennedy, who was looking for house decorations. Rothko died with 800 unsold paintings. So why are some affected by Rothko more than others? Well, according to Rothko, 
not everyone was actually equipped to understand his paintings. Rothko said, When a crowd of people looks at a painting, I think of blasphemy. I believe that a painting can only communicate directly to a rare individual, who happens to be in tune with it, and the artist. This seems a little arrogant and pretentious, and I guess it is, but we have to remember that times were different when Rothko was coming up in the 1940s. Rothko and the rest of the abstract expressionists were fighting to achieve mainstream recognition, and were used to getting snubbed, ridiculed, and generally misunderstood by nearly everyone. People just didn't have the context for what Rothko and other modern artists were trying to do at the time. But Rothko wasn't completely wrong either. Some people just can't get into his paintings. And there probably won't ever be a final word on the matter. People are just different, have different experiences, and when faced with the utter ambiguity of Rothko's paintings, are just not able to experience feelings of ecstasy, tragedy, and doom. But Rothko was far too pessimistic about the public's ability to comprehend his art. It took a generation for the world to catch up to Rothko and other new school abstractionists. New generations of museum goers are more open to what art can be. They bring less baggage to the table and attempt to view art on the terms set by the artist. Millions of people now interact with Rothko's paintings with the reverence and understanding Rothko thought most people incapable of. It just took a generation for the world to catch up and to have the so-called religious experience Rothko enjoyed while painting. Of course, all that being said, the best way to look at a Rothko, though, is still in person.